When Pastor Giuseppe died, our church had several leaders going in several different directions. It took three years for us to uni unify enough to choose a leader. And the one thing that the church could agree on, they wanted a King James preacher. And we're still there, amen? We are, right? But there are a lot of folks who teach error and preach from the King James Bible. The, uh, when I was looking up the King James issue, why I use the King James, I just typed that in to Google. Google's going to tell me why we use the King James, right? And uh, you know the first thing that got hit? A Mormon uh, site to tell why we use the King James. Now, they use the King James, but we don't trust what they say. Amen? So if someone were to come into our church and, and they say something like, well, I'm not sure that Jesus is God, or not sure that he was born a virgin, or not sure that hell has everlasting fire, we throw him out on his ear. Amen? We can recognize that. But we're continuing to peer into some subtle teaching that kind of lie in the shadows of folks who wear our label, the label of independent fundamental Baptists. These are folks that preach from the King James Bible, folks that use the right words, Folks who espouse teaching that can lead to vain, empty worship. Now, some of these teachings, no, they won't lead you to not being saved or, you know, straight up heresy. But they will lead to vain worship, meaning the worship becomes empty. And... If you mix lie with the truth, God is not pleased. Should, because even though they preach certain things with volume and passion, if you look a little closer, it's not in the Bible. Not really. Sure, someone may lift a verse or a phrase from context and then read their own cultural or racial bias into it. But that doesn't mean that it's Bible truth. The Bible says, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So far, so far we've explored, <coughs> pardon me, the dark manipulation of scripture made by folks who had racist leanings. We then discovered uh, several teachings about modesty that's often repeated in scripture that were either misrepresented or not there in the first place. Even though the Bible does teach modesty, we needed to define it and look at it. We learned subtle ways that the good truth about the King James Bible can actually be twisted to teach that extra-biblical revelation occurred when the translators did their work in 1611. We saw that a healthy respect for a pastor can be twisted into elevating him above his station and giving him the place of unquestionable authority. And I suppose that's the root of most of the issues that we're talking about is the elevation of man's opinion above God's word. So tonight, we move into this really broad subject called personal standards. Oh, that's a great preaching word. Uh, rev um, evangelists, preachers, Bible conferences, can preach strong about 
We need to have standards, and we should. Amen? Yes? Okay. But it's also important to, to be able to discern between a personal standard and a universal Bible mandate. Personal standards are what? Personal. Now, if I were to say I believe in the virgin birth, and you were to say I don't believe in the virgin birth, and somebody said, well, I don't know about the virgin birth at all, but then another person said, hey, that's okay, as long as we're fully persuaded in his own mind, are, is that correct? No, because that's not a personal standard. That's a Bible doctrine. Are you with me? But when we come to personal standards, they can be different. People have different personal standards, and they all can be correct so long as they pursue it correctly. So these are the stands that can make for great discussion, but not clearly articulated in Scripture. Lines that folks have decided not to cross or lines that folks have decided, you know, in my life or in my family's life, this is where we're going to stand. So we have questions like, should a Christian play cards? Should a Christian dance? When my wife saw me dance, she decided no. <laughs> What? Not that one, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Which car uh, should a Christian watch cartoons with talking animals? Yes, that was a question in one of the churches. Should a Christian listen to rock? Listen to country? Listen to jazz? Listen to Fox News? Should a Christian vote Democrat, Republican, Libertarian? Should a Christian vote at all? Folks have strong opinions. But where do we land? Tonight, we're going to discover a few principles that really help us to know what the Bible really says when it comes to personal standards. There's a couple of, of uh, truths we're going to lay down tonight. And th as we articulate these truths, then God can help use these truths to help you in your own walk, in your own as you lead your family to say, okay, these are the directions I need to go and these are the principles. Are you with me? Okay. Principle number one. There is nothing unclean of itself. Now this is a big deal. You have, uh, well, let's, let's look at the verse. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus. There is nothing unclean of itself. To him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now this is, this is kind of a, a, a game changer, really, when it comes to developing personal standards. Now, that does not mean that there is nothing unclean to you. It means that there's nothing unclean of itself. But to you, there may be a bunch of things unclean, depending on how they affect you. I know and am persuaded. No is the Greek word oida, or absolute positive knowledge. So the Apostle Paul is laying down a strong foundation here. I absolutely know, and I am, and am persuaded. It's in perfect tense. Paul's reasoning has gone on through a process to a point where it is now complete. I've been thinking about this. I've been praying about this. God the Holy Spirit has determined or helped me determine this truth. I know, and I'm persuaded he would not be budged from this conviction that there's nothing unclean or 
Um, the Greek word is koinon, which is there's nothing common in the Levitical sense. The context has to do with religious scruples regarding uh, animal flesh and vegetarian diet, keeping one day against another. Paul's declaration says um, that in principle the apostle is uh, siding with the strong. He has no scruples about meat or drinks. and. Uh, He says, as a Christian, not as a libertine, that Paul has a conviction in Christ Jesus, and he's sure that there's nothing in the world essentially unclean. All things can be consecrated and Christianized for Christian use. Are you hearing me? All things can be used for Christian use. Now, um, that's our first principle. We look to this, we want, we want to say, okay, I want to develop some, some personal standards. Now, if I were to say to you, um, well, Paul was battling something called Gnosticism in the, it, it was, it was a, it was a philosophy that was infecting everything, the, both uh, in the, the, the um, secular realm and in the religious realm. Could somebody tell me, can, can you break it down real simply, what Gnosticism was? Any, any idea? Okay. Okay, yes. It, 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 from the from the Greek word gnosko um, has something to do with knowledge. It was the knowledge or the thought that every inanimate object had either evil or good attached to it. So you have holy pews, holy wood. You have unholy pews. Going back with uh, the, um, the idea of meat sacrifice to idols. Paul was saying, um, guys, it's barbecue. And it smells wonderful, right? We're not worrying about whether or not this was a saved cow or an unsaved cow. It was a cooked cow, and it was a good cow, right? Um, so the, the battle of Gnosticism was a battle over... Um, having inanimate objects viewed as holy or unholy. The Roman Catholic Church is all about that. You know, you have, you have holy water. It's water. It can be, you can use it for holy things. You can use it for unholy things. That's an Old Testament ritual concept, not a New Testament concept. And so Paul is saying, listen, everything can be used. There's nothing uncommon or unclean. Okay, so, but if I thought I already did that. But if someone esteemed something to be unclean, it is unclean. Paul wants the strong to realize that people differ in their ability to internalize truth. The fact that Christ's coming brought an end to the, um, to the absolute validity of the Mosaic law and explicitly the um, ritual provisions, folks were starting to Still trying to get their mind around that. Now here's an interesting thing. 
to him it is unclean. Meaning, the uncleanliness is relative. So personal standards are personal. So, if you come uh, out of a background where a particular thing, maybe an entertainment um, mode, led you down a wrong road or a bad road, then to you, it would be wise to leave it alone. Let's say, for example, let's say you were addicted to gambling, right? And like that's what you did and consumed you, you get saved. God, the Holy Spirit says, hey, you shouldn't be under that power. You say, I'm leaving that alone. Now you go over to a Christian's house and uh, they have, they're, they're playing a game with cards. There's no money. They're just playing a game with cards. We say, oh, I can't do that. Now, maybe you can't because the cards trigger all these the things and memories and stuff, so you leave it alone. Does that mean the other guys are in sin? No, but it means you need to leave it alone. All right, so the first thing is um, there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him to esteem with anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Next principle found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. All things are lawful. Pastor, it sounds like you don't have any standards at all. You're, well, hang on, okay? All things are lawful. Let's read the verse. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power or control of any. It's an interesting Greek play on words. The best way to explain it is it's like saying, Paul is saying, all things are in my power, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. He says all things are not expedient. Freedom is not for us. It's for others. The question is not whether or not an action is lawful or right or all right, but whether it is good. See, this is this, and, and again, it can vary depending on each person. But you could say, can I, you fill in the blank. Can I watch this show on TV? Can I play this sport? Can I do this entertainment? Can I whatever? And that's one question. But perhaps a better question is, should I? You say, well, listen, I just want to know the right and wrong. This is where you talk to God, and God will show you whether you should. See, Paul says, I will not be controlled by anything which I allow. I will not be enslaved. Now, I want everybody to hear me now, kids and adults. You can choose to do something that for an adult may not be a stumbling block. But you could be a kid, and for you it would be. Let me give you an example. For me, and if, if you've ever played video games with me, you know, I give a rip about video games, at least today's video games. Now, listen, we want to talk about uh, Galaxia or... or, uh, or uh, Space Invaders, then, yeah, I'll, I'll probably spend hours. But, um, you know, Mario and all that, I don't care. But if you start a game 
and then all of a sudden you just cannot stop. Mom and Dad says stop. You don't care. Um, you're going to disobey. Why? Because you are brought under the power. Then it may be wise to not do it at all. You say, are you saying that Mario Kart is a sin? No. All things are lawful. Here, yeah, good, Mario Kart. Okay. But not all things are expedient. I'll not be brought under the power of any. And so then that goes across the board to all kinds of stuff. You know, whether it is a, a chosen entertainment, whether it is uh, food, whether it is sleep, anything. I'll not be brought under the power of any. See, now, it's one thing to say, okay, can I do this? Can I do that? And, and you have some pastors who will say, yes, do this. No, don't do that. Follow my rules. Well, that's easy enough, but we're going to be missing some stuff as far as what is wise biblically. And by saying, oh, it's wrong, that's not what the Bible says. And so w later, when folks start digging into things on their own, they're going to say, oh, well, the Bible never said what you said. You see what I'm saying? Okay, next your liberty could cause someone to stumble. Look at verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charit and charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. So you say, hey, I don't care what you say. You know, you're worried that I may have, this meat may have been sacrificed to idle man. It is, it is roast beef on the grill and it's good. Get out of here. Well, hang on, if your brother was raised in a pagan situation, you probably shouldn't throw that in his face. You're saying, so he can have one standard and I can have another? Yes. So it may be that though you say, yes, I love my roast beef, love it at home. What is that? Is that? Hypocritical. No, it's loving. If you grieve your brother with your liberty, you're not walking in love. Now, next, don't destroy your brother with your meat. Paul warns that in some circumstance, freedom might cause distress for the weak. Christ didn't die only for those that are strong in the faith, but for all who call him Lord. So life needs to be guided by principles of love. And when it is, we'll not think so much of our right to do things as our responsibility to others. Now, there's a balance to this, though. Because the Bible commands in um, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, stand fast in the, in the liberty. Where we're, so we don't want to, in trying to be sensitive to folks, we don't want to foster a spirit of bondage either, a bondage to this idea that we talked about on Sunday morning where you have to merit God's favor by the, by the weak and beggarly elements. Do this, don't do that. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. He's talking about Christian liberty. Um, the freedom of conscience, which has been won by Christ, which will inevitably get a bad name, if, it, if it's exercised in a loveless fashion. And then, you need to know what the kingdom is and is not. Check this out. 
For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Boy! The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, meaning it's not a bunch of lists. Your Christianity is not measured by a bunch of things that folks make up and then pat themselves on the back for following. It's not extra biblical opinions and standards. What is it? It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The righteousness um, consists in giving others, giving to others and to God what is their due. The very first thing that is due to other people in a Christian life is sympathy and consideration. The moment that somebody becomes a Christian, the feelings of others are more important than your own. So it's a matter of this, this idea of personal standards. Say, how can I best serve God and others in my stand? It is peace. In the New Testament, peace doesn't mean simply the absence of trouble. It's not a negative thing, but an intensely positive thing. It means that everything that makes for our uh, highest good. The Jews themselves thought of peace as a state of right relationship between individuals. And so if we insist that Christian freedom means doing what we like, that is precisely the state that we can never attain. But Christianity consists entirely in personal relationships to other people, and to God. It is peace. It is joy. Christian joy can't be a selfish thing. It doesn't consist in making ourselves happy. It consists in making others happy. When we follow this principle, we become the slaves of Christ. Here's the essence of the matter. Christian freedom means that we're free to do not what we like, but what Christ likes. So, we're doing what things that have us in, uh, we're doing what the things that have us in our grip make us do, but once the power of Christ enters us, we take control of ourselves, make sure that we're not being controlled by something else, and put love as our primary motivation. These things get tricky. They can get complicated. But these are the standards and these are the principles that we need to understand and focus on as we develop personal standards. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Thank you for bringing us together tonight. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless our, uh, our evening. I pray, God, that you would dismiss us in, in a bit. Thank you, God, for this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hymn